my my daughters are sitting there saying, who, who are they talking to? <laughs> Thank you, and I, I'm uh, honored and a bit amazed to receive this recognition and follow in the footsteps of incredible individuals like Lucinovich, Cal Stiller, Joe Rothman, John Burks, and others. And if my achievements represent even a small fraction of what of theirs, I really am pleased. In the next few minutes, I want to take time to thank a few people, comment on my mentors, and predict some of the developments of life sciences that I think will mold the future. I'm delighted that my father, and ski partner of 63 years, has come in from Montreal to join us tonight, as has my sister Marilyn and her husband, Henry Layton. My younger sister Ellen and her husband George Fattis are here, and of course my terrific partner of these past nine years, Evelyn Philbin. I'm also pleased to be joined by our children, Shoshana and Reed, Kayla and Jonathan, and their partners Melanie and Jeremy, and our special act, Dorothy and Adoni. There's been another set of important individuals in my life, and they are my teachers and my mentors. My PhD supervisor at McGill, Tom Chang, was one of the fathers of nanotechnology. And he used Socratic methods to teach me to ask questions, frame in terms of experimentation. I cannot point to a single mentor from my days at Harvard Medical School, but the entire experience of being exposed to so many brilliant students and faculty was essential in shaping many of my values going forward. In Edmonton, there were three key individuals. Doug Wilson, Dean of Benson, who encouraged me to test the waters of administration and leadership. Lionel McLeod, who was the first president of the Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research. And Peter Lahey, who more than any other politician I've ever met, understood the need for good, visionary public policy and its effect on the public good. I was lucky to be part of a group who were able to make wholesale changes to a rather conservative faculty of medicine and bring it to an internationally competitive level. Even President Obama recognized that in his first inaugural speech when he made reference to the end of the protocol and the treatment of type 1 diabetes. It was in Edmonton, it was in Edmonton actually, that I first met Cal Stiller, who was instrumental in bringing the East to London and the Robarts Research Institute. There, I was lucky to have Cal as a friend, as a colleague, and as a mentor, but also to learn from the likes of Henry Barnett, one of Canada's foremost clinical researchers, and Darcy McHugh, another politician who knew something about the public good. Working these past years with extraordinary current and former public servants, such as Michelle Lobo, Ken Knox, and George Ross, has been incredible. And it's, while it's a well-worn axiom, I wish that I had that knowledge and experience they offered me as mentors earlier on in my, my career. And then, of course, there were the weekly instructions that I got, as many others do, from Lou Suminovich. He's not only an inspiration, but he's virtually always right. Now, finally, in talking about the future, I'm borrowing from the Ontario Genomics Institute annual report for the year 2050. The introduction to which I wrote in 2011. So let's turn for a moment to the future and the year 2050. Well, we actually made it through another half century. Back in 2011, I wasn't so sure. Malaria, tuberculosis, obesity, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, they were almost unchecked. And Ontario was spending almost 50% of its budget on healthcare. And you should have seen the particles and the pollution. The quality of the air in, our, in Toronto was awful. Many men took to wearing dark shirts because white ones turned black by an in any case. The poor asthmatics, thank God they had those inhalers. But not only was the air polluted, our lakes and rivers were going from bad to worse. With people lamenting the loss of clear, crisp streams, but continuing to pollute. Then there were those folks in Alberta who were getting rich mining liquid gold. 
while contributing to global warming and the demise of our beautiful glaciers and the threat of coastal flooding. Food shortages abounded around the world as water for agriculture, water, became scarce and became very expensive. We were doing relatively little to stave off of starvation in vast parts of the world. Social networking was all the craze. It resulted in major uprisings around the world as poor people rose up against the rich and the corrupt shades of the French Revolution. If nothing else, it helped us to raise our consciousness to a whole raft of issues. So how did we make it through those terrifying days? In our nutshell, we discovered real life science and solutions. We were in the middle of an important revolution derived from advances in genomics, and few of us even realized it. Well, one person did. The Harvard-based futurist and venture capitalist Juan Enriquez. In 2005, his first book, As the Future Catches You, predicted how the biotechnology industry was going to change our world, our health, our food, and our environment. <clears throat> then in 2008, he wrote a book called Homo Evolutus, a short tour of a new species. He suggested that in a few short years, Homo sapiens had evolved through what he called hypernatural evolution into a new hominoid species that he called Homo evolutus, a species that could directly and deliberately control the evolution of its own species and of others, and it did. Most reacted to the book in those days, come on, get real, because you're starting to believe your own fantasies. But wait a minute, maybe he was right. We all still look the same and even act the same, but a new species? Well, he was right about controlling the evolution of our own and other species, and we did it by understanding biology through genomics, and making changes that have changed our planet in very positive ways, at least in terms of our own survival. But how did genomics ever help us to avoid the bullet and save our backsides? We've genetically modified all sorts of food to make them healthier and safer, and to allow us to grow vegetables using less water and fewer and cheaper fertilizers. One of the most outstanding developments occurred in 2015, when genetic manipulation of wheat, corn, and rice allowed, us to, allowed, us, allowed for their growth in brackish water, that is water that is not totally devoid of salt. This increased the arable land worldwide by more than 50%. Vitamin A and num a number of different vaccines were incorporated into plant and microbial genomes, decreasing the incidence of childhood blindness and in a number of infectious diseases in some of the most impoverished areas of the world. Famine has decreased around the world and our own health has improved. We're not living much longer, but we are living healthier, and critically, we've stemmed the growth in healthcare costs. Infectious diseases are still common, but now we rapidly deploy genomics and need microbes to produce vaccines within days. We haven't seen a case of malaria or tuberculosis in almost two decades, and we have new therapies for some of those often energetic degenerative diseases. Personalized medicine is no longer a myth or a promise. The right medicine at the right dose for a particular patient has now become common practice. Cancer and heart disease are still too common, but in many cases, genomics has allowed us to better understand them and to control, if not cure, two of these most devastating conditions, which used to, say, to take so many so early. And by the way, I haven't seen a smoker in almost 20 a decade. We've come to understand and treat many of those addictive behaviors. But it wasn't just genomics that saved our bacon. A tipping point occurred around 2013 with the convergence of life sciences, regenomics, and information technologies. It shouldn't have been that difficult. In 2012, Google would allow you to interrogate over a million in images in less than a second while well, it took two weeks for an x-ray to cross University Avenue. <laughs> but suddenly we caught on, and we had tons of data, and really smart people to write code to decipher that data. Medical technologies had caught up 
with information technologies. But the hardest nut to crack was the environment, as we still wanted our luxuries, our cars, and our air conditioning. Do you remember when Craig Venter, the champion of the private sector human genome project, decided that he would make oil directly from the sun and genetically modify algae using techniques of synthetic biology? Well, we've not only lowered our carbon footprint, but we've cleaned up our environment. Well, not just us, but also microbes trained genetically. In fact, we didn't even have to train them all. Some of them knew how to do it on their own to clean up our lakes and our rivers. They even allowed us to make extraction of oil from the tar sands more environmentally friendly. The carbon footprint is still a problem, but at least it's a clean one. And maybe one day, algae and microbes will help us to wean ourselves off fossil fuels entirely. In a nutshell, it was research developments and innovation in genomics and the life sciences that saved our aid. Unfortunately, there was something in my crystal ball that I couldn't quite make out. Did Ontario embrace the life, sci life sciences revolution to create sector, private sector jobs and wealth from the discoveries made in their academic institutions? Or did they continue to derive their primary wealth by mining their natural resources and attempting to be in advanced manufacturing? I desperately hope that the former was the case.